Welcome to our pre-show chat for Unity 1918 by Kevin Kerr. Uh, joining us today uh, will be Kevin Kerr, Sky Brandon, Moira Day, and Erica Dick. Kevin Kerr is a playwright and a founding member, member of Vancouver's Electric Company Theatre, with whom he's collaborated on the creation of more than a dozen full-length productions, including Brilliant, Studies in Motion, and Tear the Curtain. He received the 2002 Governor General's Literary Award for his play Unity 1918, which has been produced more than 100 times across Canada and around the world. Other plays include Skydive, Spine, both for Real Wheels Theatre, The Remnants Man, Sunshine Theatre, Secret World of Og, Carousel Theatre for Young People, and The Night Night's Mare, Caravan Farm Theatre. He also co-wrote the feature film adaptation, The Score for CBC Television, Screen Siren Productions, and collaborated with Stan Douglas on his interactive immersive national film board installation, Circa 1948. His latest project is a suite of virtual reality installations that accompany Electric Company Theatre's newest production, The Full Light of Day. Kevin joined the University of Victoria's Department of Writing in 2012. He currently teaches playwriting and screenwriting with a creative focus on cinematic theatre hybrids, collaborative creation, site-specific theatre, and interactive narratives. Sky Brandon. Sky is a Treaty 6 actor, director, producer, instructor based in Saskatoon. He has worked for numerous Saskatchewan companies, Persephone Theatre, Shakespeare on the Saskatchewan, Dancing Sky Theatre, Globe Theatre, Station Arts Centre, a number of indie companies for Live 5 for whom Sky helped co-found, as well as nationally, including the Stratford Festival, Shakespeare in the Ruins, and the Drayton, Drayton Entertainment. He is currently on the board of directors for the Saskatchewan Association of Theatre Professionals, where he has recently finished serving a two-year term as board chair. Sky is both a BFA and MA alumnus of the U of S. Moira Day. <clears throat> Moira Day is a professor of drama at the University of Saskatchewan, where she also serves as an adjunct member of Women's and Gender Studies and the Classical, Medieval and Renaissance Studies Unit. In addition to co coordinating the graduate area and teaching dramatic theory, history, and literature in the Department of Drama, she has served as department head since 2007. A former book editor and co-editor of Theatre Research in Canada, uh, I'll butcher that, Researcher Theatre au Canada, <laughs> she has published and lectured widely in the field of Canadian theatre with particular focus on women and prairie theatre prior to 1960. Her editing projects have included The Hungry Spirit, a play anthology featuring the work of pioneering Western Canadian playwright, The West of All Possible Worlds, an anthology of contemporary prairie play playwrights, Westwards, celebrating Western Canadian theatre and playwriting, a collection of essays featuring the contemporary theatre in Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta theatre. And most recently, performing Turtle Island, Indigenous theatre on the world stage, co-edited with Kathleen Irwin and Jesse Ray Archbold Archer, an anthology of essays on contemporary Indigenous performance and theatre in Canada. She also co-edited a special issue with Mary Blackstone on contemporary Saskatchewan theatre for CTI. Erica Dick is a professor of history and Canadian research chair in the history of medicine at the University of Saskatchewan. In 2014, Dick was inducted to the new College of Scholars, Artists and Scientists at the Royal Society of Canada. Born and raised in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Dick began her undergraduate schooling at the University of Saskatchewan before transferring to Dalhousie University. She returned to her hometown for her master's degree before enrolling at McMaster University for her PhD in history of medicine. While earning her doctoral degree, she was convinced by Larry Stewart to research experimentation in Canada, leading her to study LSD and eugenics in Saskatchewan. That is our panel that will be uh, discussing Unity 1918 and uh, all the things that come before and currently with, with the play. Um, 
I'm going to hand it over to Moira Day to uh, continue the conversation. Okay, thank you. I'm going to be kicking off as the theater historian. So I'm going to be starting off with uh, giving you a quick overview of theater and plague. And uh, I'll make it short. <laughs> so we could have the first slide, Carla. Oops. Okay, thank you. All right, so here we have two buildings. This is a, we'll start off with a quiz. What do they have in common? I said, well, if you said they're playhouses and they put plays on, that's a pretty good answer. If you said sometimes they put Shakespearean plays on and are known to do that, that's a good answer too. But the answer I'm after in terms of uh, this talk is that they both got closed down by pandemics or plagues. And uh, what you're going to find is closing the playhouses in terms of pandemic or plague is as old as theater itself. Uh, the plague or epidemic comes to town and the theaters all close. Why? Well, as uh, Mason put it, everybody comes together in very close social and physical contact in the confines of the theater. You have things going on behind the stage, you have on the stage musicians, actors, prompters, stagehands all bustling around and the audience, refreshment sellers. People just are crammed in, especially in the older theaters. They're standing, they're sitting, they're wherever you can get them in and get a dime out of them. Or, if you're there in the theater for a romantic assassination, uh, as often happened, you could be very close indeed. So maybe that's the first question. What do you do when they close your theater down? Okay, we can move on to the next slide, Carla. Well, what you could do if you were lucky enough to have a permanent home in a place like London or Paris, uh, is that you could go on the road. If a time came and the epidemics, the place came through regularly, it would close things down and you could go out to the territories, out to the provinces and circulate. If you were one of the companies that wasn't lucky enough to have a permanent home, then you were on the road indefinitely. And that was true of groups like the Commedia dell'arte. And this is a picture of the Commedia dell'arte from... Um, 1640 by someone named Yan Miel, who caught a bit of a troop coming into town. Uh, and they were famous for going all over Europe. And that's really where the saying, two boards and a passion comes in. You'd come in, you'd set up quickly, you'd attract a crowd and perform, and then you'd get out of town before the civic authorities caught you. Now, some of the objections that the town fathers had were puritanistic ones. They didn't like men dressing up as women. They didn't like people pretending to be who they weren't. Or they didn't like the kind of people players attracted. Uh, pickpockets, thieves, prostitutes, cutthroats, uh, erring husbands and wives who were meeting their lovers in the crowd. So even if they didn't have problems with the players, they had trouble with the kind of people that they attracted. But you found that even lenient time, time fathers didn't like the players arriving in times of plague or war. And that's going to be very important to uh, what happens in later periods as well. Now, as I said, this picture is from 1640. But the Commedia actually declined a lot over the 17th century because of things like the Thirty Years' War which brought a lot of war with it, and with the war, a lot of plague and illness. So you found the combination was really a deadly one, especially for Canadian troops. It disrupted travel routes. It was hard for you to get out of town. And if you managed to get out of town and not getting mugged or murdered or die on the road and survive the trip to the next town, very likely there were people there to make sure you didn't come in. It's a bit like the borders closing now. Now, one ironic exception to this actually was this. Okay, next one, Carla. Aberamigal. 
One of the great ironies is that one of the best known passion plays in the world was established in 1634 as a response to the plague. Uh, the story is that somebody wanted to come home to Aberamagal. He brought the plague with him. People started to die. So in 1633, the town said, if they were spared the plague, they would do a passion play into perpetuity. And uh, in fact, it's been running for almost 400 years now, every 10 years, with few exceptions. I was supposed to see this play in 2020. Anybody want to guess what happened in 2020? Yes, you're right. The play that got founded in response to a plague going away got canceled by a plague, though they hope they will be able to go on in 2022. So we're going to move up into the time scale. Theaters closing in 1918. So moving up to the sketch of 1918, which is setting of Unity 1918, anything I said about war and epidemics being hard on theater applies here. The professional theater in Saskatoon at this time was almost exclusively a touring theater. Professionals who came in on tour from the States, from Eastern Canada, from Britain, sometimes even from Europe. And uh, it was, they come sometimes with stock companies, they might stay for a couple of weeks, couple of months. Touring companies, they might come for a few nights or even for a week, and then they move on to the next place on the circuit. But arguably the touring theater never really recovered from the double whammy of World War I, which again, disrupted circuits. Uh, disrupted play centers, especially in Europe, and um, sometimes troops dissolved because everybody ran off and enlisted. And just as it looked like things were coming in, they were hit with a pandemic, the 1918 influenza, and arguably the touring theater never really recovered from that. In Canada, it was going to be replaced by the great amateur era of theater until about 1945, and then it began to develop its own professional theater. Okay, go ahead, Carla. So, but of course, with 2020 and the theaters closing again because of another global pandemic, we're experiencing sort of an odd synchronicity of times that are both alike and not alike. And there are some people, though they're very old, who've lived through both pandemics. They lived through the 1918 epidemic and they lived through this one. So it, the two are still within living memory of each other, which is really quite extraordinary if you think about it. So when we look at Unity 1918, go ahead, Carla. It's made our production Unity 1918, which has done part of our 75th anniversary celebrations as a department, kind of an odd crossroads of the past and the present in Saskatchewan and of theater then and now. So that's my little introduction as the theater historian. So we're going to move on to the real historian now. So that's Erica. Uh, Erica, we talked earlier about pandemics uh, or epidemics earlier. You mentioned they were nothing new in the world experience or even the Canadian experience, at least in the Maritimes, Quebec and Ontario, which are older Canada. But it was new to Saskatchewan and that was all the harder because they were completely unprepared for us. Can you tell us why? Yeah, I think, I think it's a bit of a misnomer to think that uh, the flu pandemic was the first that Saskatchewan had experienced, but it is it did concentrate efforts in a particular way. So Saskatchewan residents, um, settlers and Indigenous populations alike had dealt with a lot of different kinds of uh, diseases, some endemic, some pandemic, smallpox, of course, type typhoid, uh, tuberculosis, but the flu pandemic coming as it did at the same, you know, on the heels of the First World War really challenged a lot of people in the province to sort of think through how they came together, how they fell apart, how to, how to uh, cope with these situations. And one of the things we know from the history of infectious diseases as is that these pandemics often create similar patterns of responses. There's panic, there's grief, there's isolation, and there is a pressing desire to move through the pandemic and get on with the business of forgetting. And I think this was really important, um, not only in Saskatchewan, but in thinking about the place of theater in the role of helping to reflect and helping to cope or helping to integrate the experiences of a pandemic into a post-pandemic life. And, and this really strikes me as an interesting moment because theaters, as you mentioned, were one of the first things to close. All of these public gathering spaces are forced to close and Saskatchewan, of course, is no exception there. 
But as we move through the pandemic, as people begin to sort of piece together who they trust, whether they're willing to come back into those spaces, whether the right crowds are hanging out at the theaters, as you alluded to in your own remarks, you know, those kinds of moments are really important for bringing communities back together and helping to heal from these pandemic moments. And we're seeing that in the influenza pandemic today, but we definitely have examples of this in previous pandemics where those public gathering spaces coming together to laugh, to cry, to grieve, to perform, those are really healing moments that help bring communities back together. And, um, and I think this is a really timely moment for this play to be put on here at the University of Saskatchewan for the same reasons. Yeah, just down the pandemic certainly had an impact on the University of the Big Cities like Saskatoon. Maybe you can just explain where the plaque's from? Absolutely. So this plaque represents some of the volunteer work that was done at the University of Saskatchewan. So Saskatoon became a bit of an epicenter of pandemic response in the 1918 flu pandemic. And this, um, this plaque on the wall inside the administrative building or the Peter McKinnon building at the University of Saskatchewan commemorates the volunteers who stepped forward to help provide um, health services. Um, and this could be anything from administering the modest medicines that they had available, mostly these were alcohol-based, um, providing some kind of care, but also performing duties within the quarantine center, which was at Emmanuel College on campus. We know that one person died at the University of Saskatchewan campus, um, there's another plaque to him, William Hamilton. Um, and if we look through the names here, there are mostly volunteer nurses, and these were women who were pressed into service, but there are a few other examples, and I can't see it right here where it's clipped off, um, but Thorberger Thorvaldson, so one of the faculty faculty members, and there were other faculty members as well who um, performed services during this time. And the university became an important space for sort of a clustering, uh, a quarantining effect as the rest of the city was shut down. So there was some movement through the university, but also a lot of focus. And even though we didn't have Zoom or internet or the kind of media um, options at the time, certainly newspapers and the introduction of radio was drawing attention to the efforts of people on campus and also the potential of the optimism invested in scientific research at the time for helping to combat the flu. And that is completely um, similar with what we see today. In the play, Bee's father talks about leaving Unity to look for work in Saskatoon and trusting that things are going to be better there. Why might he think that? You know, I think that um, the, the flu, and this again is, is true of other uh, infectious diseases as well, they affect communities differently urban spaces, we might have other, we might have places where we can, we can hide differently. And we might think of rural places as being maybe better served in a moment of a pandemic when we wanna be away from other people. But in fact, people living in rural communities have suffered a whole variety of different kinds of concerns. Um, they couldn't get supplies. Sometimes they couldn't get food, especially during the winter, of course. Um, trains were loath to stop or sometimes stopped in particular places and not others. And so there were rural dynamics that made it very difficult and I think challenging and probably animated those feelings of panic and mistrust even more so in those rural communities. In the city, there was a sense that you could get away from some of those things. There were drug stores. There was a, a drug store in Saskatoon that was permitted to sell alcohol during the prohibition. You can move to the next slide for that. And this becomes a bit of an interesting topic for myself as a medical historian, looking at ways that um, people are using different tonics, some of them are mostly just alcohol based, as ways to sort of move through the regulations at the time, which prohibited the use of alcohol, but also use this for medicinal purposes or simply to ease the anxiety and the fear that people felt of catching the flu. As soldiers were coming in, of course, they would spread out through the cities, but also sort of filter them through the rural areas. And I think there was a real concern about, you know, how we're going to manage this. How do we manage the distrust that people feel? And so turning to experimental therapies, again, including alcohol, and we saw this as well during COVID-19, you know, suggestions that you could try different things, um, many of which were quite harmful. This was true as well in 1918. So Saskatoon had a variety of different opportunities that um, people could explore, um, both in terms of finding work. Um, there were essential services. There were, of course, people who were providing health services, but also funeral services, which were prohibited in terms of public grieving, but there were still grave diggers and there were still people who had to manage the, the piling up of bodies. If we recall that 
The flu killed more Saskatchewan residents than the war did. There were, it would really moved around the world um, and had catastrophic effects on the social relations. And in the cities, I think that was felt very acutely, but I think people also felt that they could do something or contribute to their communities in some ways. We said one thing we've experienced in 2020 was that even if COVID didn't directly kill people, it destroyed people or caused their death in other ways. And there's been terrible disruptions in our rituals for taking care of people, saying goodbye to them and grieving afterwards. You said that was particularly true in 1918 in rural districts like Unity. Can you expand on that? Yeah, there are some really harrowing tales and stories of families that starved to death or children whose parents died, but they couldn't reach care. And so the children either died or were left malnourished. Um, really tragic stories. There was initiative in the 1980s to go back and do community histories and reading through some of the rural Canadian, rural Saskatchewan histories, you find the imprint of the flu pandemic on the way that communities remember this time. There's often these books are filled with celebratory stories, sometimes humorous stories, you know, births and deaths, but the flu has a special place as people remember it as a really difficult time of not being able to trust their neighbors. They weren't worried, people wanted to check in on each other, but without the access to telephones and without the access to communication, um, it was very difficult and there was a lot of mistrust built up. So families suffered tremendously during this period. We don't have a lot of um, historical language for describing in very nuanced ways the kind of mental health toll that it took. But I think certainly today with a broadened vocabulary for thinking about mental health, anxiety, depression, the traumas that people face during COVID, it's easy to now look back and recognize that some of these stories are actually revealing a kind of burden, a mental health burden that people were suffering as well. And it's difficult to measure that or really quantify what that meant in terms of the impact that it had on rural communities. But we certainly see it in the slow recovery, the slow ways that churches began to perform services again, the slow recovery of finding those public spaces for grieving, for laughing together, for performing together. And I think this is an imprint that is, will leave, COVID will also leave that kind of collective imprint on our memory. Mm -hmm. One thing we talked about the other day, Erica, was uh, it's relevant to the play because women seem to take on so much of the role of taking care of people. There's the doctors, but then there's a whole network of people take care, and that was really disrupted by uh, the ep epidemic. Can you just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, of course. During the First World War, a lot of the men left um, or were pressed into to different kinds of, kinds of service, either performing agricultural roles or moving into uh, work. And women often started off as volunteers, but when the men were returning, these women didn't get a, a break. So they, they took on these roles during the war. And then as the pandemic rolled in, um, they were again pressed into service to provide healthcare, so oftentimes without compensation. So they weren't paid for the work necessarily, but women, especially at this time, were expected to have kind of innate healthcare uh, or healing qualities. Women and mothers are supposed to just know what to do, I suppose. And this idea, that sentiment then extended into help providing kind of nursing care during this time. Also, it's important to keep in mind that in rural Saskatchewan, there were only 11 hospitals outside of Saskatoon and Regina. Um, so this means that most of the healthcare, even prior to the pandemic arriving, um, relied on a variety of informal networks um, sometimes formal ne formalized networks of midwives and nursing care, but often these are, you know, a single woman working in, say, northern Saskatchewan, or perhaps even in Unity. Unity had a, a small hospital, but in the local area, there might be one woman who was expected to travel around to different families. She sometimes didn't know those families. These were usually young women. In fact, when women were married, they weren't allowed to continue working in this capacity. So you imagine these young women who are moving around maybe um, delivering a baby at one point, um, caring for a farm accident wound at another point. And when the flu pandemic comes in, now they've got a whole host of other responsibilities in terms of moving around. There are some harrowing stories of these women. Some of them are amazing. The bravery that they expressed, the ingenuity that they demonstrated in terms of their capacity to travel around, but also to care for people in really unique and creative ways but there are also some very tragic stories. 
There's one of a woman in southwestern Saskatchewan who just got her first post as a public health nurse uh, when the flu pandemic arrived in her community. And she died um, caring for people during the pandemic, but many of the families that she, that she served survived and uh, they named the school after her. Um, but it, there are these really fascinating stories of the ways that women face this often without a lot of support. Okay, thanks. Okay, Kevin, I was wondering if we could move to you. Uh, when you wrote the play, just at the turn of the 21st century, COVID was nowhere in sight. Why write a play about the influenza then? And why place it in Unity of Saskatchewan? The influenza was a global phenomenon. Why not write a play about the flu in Vancouver instead since that's where the play was first produced? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mara. That's, uh, those are great questions. Um, well, yes, um, true. When I wrote it, there was no, there was no COVID-19. Um, little did I know that I would um, <clears throat> have a sort of resurgence 20 years later, but um, uh, it's, uh, it was a real confluence of things that kind of prompted the play. I didn't actually know anything about the Spanish flu when I began uh, the early sort of thinking about this project. Um, it kind of started from a couple of different other points of interest or questions I was pondering at the time. Um, and, 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 and specifically a character. Uh, I had been carrying around the idea of, a, of writing a play that featured a, um, a, uh, a young uh, woman uh, undertaker. Um, and it was inspired by a conversation I had had in high school with a friend who was discussing you know, career plans and she decided that she wanted to be a mortician. And that image um, I found uh, really compelling and surprising and it uh, was incongruous with what I knew about her and also all the stereotypes I might have carried about what I thought a, you know, an undertaker might look like. So that idea of this character was sort of living with me for years and then uh, I was trying to begin work on a project in a playwriting workshop and, um, and I thought maybe I'd pursue that character. Um, and then at that point, my question was, well, where would she be? What, should, what would she be up to? Uh, what would be a story that, that she could inhabit? And the first you know, thought I had was that she should be somewhere uh, where a lot of people were dying because that would keep her busy and that would make things interesting for her. So uh, I began to think about that and, and I, on a kind of a, somewhat of a, um, a, a bit of a uh, impulse um, uh, went and uh, researched the Spanish flu, which they said I didn't really know anything about. Uh, I had heard the term, but I didn't know what it was or when it was or, or, or much about it. And, um, and then when I, uh, I, I found actually a Canadian book uh, um, about the flu from a Canadian perspective, and, um, and it was, um, I was I was kind of stunned at at the uh, scale and the and the uh, the size of this event and um and 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 then kind of surprised that I didn't know anything about it like why why didn't this inhabit my you know uh, why wasn't this sort of more embedded in the collective conscious um, so uh, that's really intrigued me you know because it, there it was right at the end of World War One which is of course has a huge place in our kind of national narrative. Um, so uh, it began to kind of trigger these questions around the, uh, the difference between what we think of as glorious death versus inglorious death. And, and, um, and so that was, that was sort of where that kind of opened up for me uh, as, a, as a sort of backdrop, I guess, to the play. And then the other thing that was also on my mind at the time was just the presence of sort of the apocalypse myth in, in, uh, in, our, in our culture, when that kind of comes back into, um, into, our, um, into the foreground every so often, it seems that we uh, get interested in the idea of the end of the world. And uh, when I wrote the play, it was, when I was doing the research and early writing of it, it was just in the run up to the turn of the century. And there was a lot of, you know, there was a lot of um, 
a kind of a renewed interest in the idea of, you know, uh, the end of the world. There was the whole Y2K panic, which was, you know, um, uh, rather underwhelming as uh, when it actually, uh, when, we, when we turned the clock over. Uh, but also there was the, the emergence of a number of doomsday cults uh, that uh, appeared at the time. And uh, there were um, suicides en masse uh, within these groups. Um, and so that uh, kind of energy around thinking about end times was also something of, uh, I was curious about that. So those sort of different uh, questions kind of merged together to sort of uh, make me think that this might be a period that would be interesting to write about uh, or to set a story in, I guess. And then why Unity and not Vancouver? Um, I think that for me was um, a little bit about just, again, a, it was, it was a, an early sort of just image or impulse when I began to write, thinking about where this place would be, where this story would be set. And, um, and the uh, idea of a small Saskatchewan town um, just was the first place I landed. I was basically imagining my mom's hometown, uh, which is not Unity, but it's Foam Lake, uh, which is further east um, on, the, uh, on the Yellowhead. And, um, and so I just sort of found myself in that space. And, you know, as a kid going there regularly on summers or occasionally in the winter, um, uh, I just had a, a kind of outsider sort of response to the landscape of, of Saskatchewan. I found it very um, overwhelming in, 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 a, in a beautiful way. It's the vastness and the sense of, um, you know, the, the appearance of a community on that um, landscape as you move across it feels both so, so, um, you know, uh, um, tight and close, but also so isolated in that huge expanse. And that, that feeling of tension between being alone, but also being so uh, much more aware of your presence of, of the people around you. I found that to be um, uh, an image that, that compelled me. So, yeah. I think people would like to know how strongly is the play actually based on actual incidents, people, stories, and places in Saskatchewan, and how much of it sort of comes out of here? Yeah, um, it's pretty fictitious. Uh, and I guess there was a risk in naming it, uh, naming the play, and also naming the town in the play after an actual town in, in, in Saskatchewan, uh, because it's a, it's a very much a fictitious unity. Uh, and not an historic unity, um, but um, but uh, I spent a fair bit of time doing research there, um, uh, a little bit in Unity, um, also in the uh, the archives in Regina. I spent time in Saskatoon, and I also spent a lot of time in Foam Lake and surrounding communities where I had my family, and I did a lot of um, uh, just um, uh, in interviews with people that uh, at that time. Uh, had memories of the of the uh, of the pandemic, um, and so I listened to their stories and what they remembered as kids growing up uh, or experiencing that as children in the middle of of, of this uh, moment. Um, and so there were things that I discovered along the way, or that I read, or 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 encountered that absolutely made its way into the play. Images of, you know, those those sort of there 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 were more. Um, you know, piecing together um, um, these these uh, these uh, sort of actions, such as the quarantining of a town or the um, burning of mail or baking of mail to to try to kill the virus before reading it, if you felt that it might have con been in contact with somebody with the uh, with the flu, um, you know, uh, and uh, um, the image of a, a a celebration event where people weren't allowed to. Be close to each other um, was drawn from um, actual, yeah, historical events. Uh, so I, a lot of a lot of images and um, and moments in the play definitely were informed by the research. And um, uh, but the characters are all 
invented um, and the you know the real personal events of the play are 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 fictitious um, yeah when I read the play I found myself thinking a little of Chekhov's the three sisters were there any classical models you were thinking of when you wrote it and uh, What's remarkable to me is that audiences all over Canada, beyond in the world, America, Australia, New Zealand, UK, have wanted to spend some time with these people, small town, 1918 in Saskatchewan. How do you account for that? Oh, um, yeah, the, uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's absolutely influences in the play, uh, theatrical influences uh, that are, are there for sure. I was really influenced by Carol Churchill's overlapping dialogue techniques that she uh, that she sort of uh, really uh, uh, pioneered in the 80s uh, and her punctuation style to help uh, actors figure out how to how to um, speak those overlapping lines. Um, it was kind of a musicality there that really excited me. So I, I just cribbed that entirely uh, from her from her technique. Um, you know, other things I, I think you could sort of say, like the plays, like the, it ends with this song that kind of comes out of nowhere. And uh, uh, I, I guess you could see that sort of a Brechtian sort of moment in the play. Um, uh, but I would say, like, in terms of models, um, I mean, one thing was I was, I was very, I think, kind of quite um, uh, conscious um, of. Um, Canadian, I guess, Canadian theater tropes that um, that I was aware of. There's, as you know, there's there's uh, in Canadian theaters uh, uh, history. Uh, uh, there's a lot of attention to history, even as a young country. A lot of our plays uh, look backwards uh, mm -hmm. in time and um, exploring the past. Um, whether it's communities like in the Donnelly's trilogy or mm -hmm. um, or families like in the Mercer cycle of uh, David French's plays um, <clears throat> or, um, or 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 even like or, um, you know um, something like Gwen Ferris Ringwood still stands the house and sort of set in the pioneering past so um, <clears throat> that aspect of it um, was I was I was you know, aware and uh, I guess wanting to sort of lean into the tropes that Canadian theater does this. It's a bit dangerous because I was also worried that the play could be um, just seen as something, um, I don't know, cliched or old fashioned or whatever, but I wanted to sort of just kind of push into the tropes of, you know, of one being history, two being um, land, you know, that presence of landscape in, uh, mm -hmm. In, in Canadian theater too, like the sort of symphonic impressionism of Herman Vogt and things like that. Uh, the um, the um, um, uh, presence of this sort of threatening landscape. Um, but I wanted to just sort of like, like um, almost code it in a way that the audience goes, oh, I think I know what this is and then try to push it out or, you know, kind right. of pop that bubble a little bit. Um, try to find a surprise inside what looks like the trope. Um, and so playing a little bit with those uh, narratives, and I guess, you know, the whole, you know, um, also just the whole World War I uh, narrative of, of in Canada as this sort of coming of age story of a nation, um, um, which was a very romantic reading of, of a horrible and useless war. Um, and, um, and uh, I, I, I wanted to sort of, you know, play with that a bit. It's a coming of age story for sure, but as you know, it's not, it's not the war, it's, it's another right. thing. So uh, yeah, I think those, those, those models were definitely um, um, there to be, um, I guess, grappled with or, or as, 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 um, as markers for me to sort of uh, move around. Um, the uh, the other part of your question uh, was about oh yeah the um, the fact that it's it's had a life outside of uh, that it's it's had it's been produced all over Canada but also it's um, been in the states and Europe and Australia New Zealand um, and other places. Um, 
Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I, th I have to say it's been really sometimes quite surprising uh, that it's even been, I guess, found by some of the people that have um, that have uh, picked it up. I think, you know, um, one of the things uh, that I find kind of uh, you, that I could think about with these with plays uh, in um, especially plays that are historical is, is that um, is that it's you know a, a kind of you know the play isn't about 1918 it's not about the past it, uh, I think for me any historical play is really about today it's 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 a lens to get to the now it's a way to create some space for the audience um, to find them, themselves in a story that um, that uh, um, gives uh, initially the illusion of the, of of, um, of um, you know not necessarily implicating that audience because mm -hmm. it's from another time, um, and therefore your guard goes down a little bit and you kind of tumble into the narrative, and then you might find yourself there. Uh, in a way that, in fact, you might you might not in a in a very modern or a play set in the very now, because mm -hmm. you can look at the stage and see the characters on the stage and go, well, I know those characters actually exist because they're twenty twenty one characters, and uh, and they're not me, so they might be somewhere in this house that I'm am in, but I know it's not me, so uh, I can sort of keep myself a little bit distant in the the the. Uh, historical play, uh, you know that none of those characters could be with you in the theater. Um, and therefore, you all could be in the, inside that play, you can find yourself in there. Um, sort of counterintuitively, I think. So um, that's my that's, that's sort of for me, the attraction to writing about times in the past is, is really it's that it's um, a little sleight of hand to get to the now. And um, and I think that also works in plays that are really specific in location too. Um, and somewhat, in some ways, uh, the play might feel um, more, strangely more accessible if you're away from the place that it's set, because then the specificity of that location allows you to sort of, you know, again, um, uh, suspend maybe your your disbelief. Uh, it's, it's it's something new and unfamiliar, and yet you can kind of believe in it because it seems like it's right. accurate. So um, so I think that's um, perhaps uh, part of the interest too is that uh, through those really specific lenses of time and space, uh, these other communities have found themselves inside the characters. I guess. Okay, well, let's move on to our director, Sky. As you know, we picked Unity 1918 as our anniversary show even before COVID struck. Can you explain why you originally wanted to do the show? And how did the events of last March change your perspective on the play? Were you ever tempted to put it aside and choose another play? <laughs> um, great questions, Moira, thanks. Um, well, I guess the first part, when I was first approached about the possibility of doing something for the anniversary. Um, I, I knew it wasn't just a automatic, what do you want to do, that it was part of a process and depending on availabilities and ideas that I might not get the opportunity to do so, although I love the idea. And so when it was kind of pitched, for lack of a better word, I started making a, a list of what plays would I be interested in doing under that umbrella of the anniversary. Then quickly decided Canadian, and then I always, even though I've been doing a lot of Shakespeare in this part of my career, when I was doing my first work after finishing my BFA, um, creating Last Exit Theatre, which was part of co-founding Live 5, almost all of that work was Canadian plays that took a historical event. Um, and very similar to Kevin's comments, I think why I tend to do that is it's usually a way to, to see how far we come, or usually though in most cases, how far we have not come and keep making the same <laughs> mistakes or errors and hitting ourselves in the head with the same bat. Um, so all the plays that I had picked kind of had that element to it. Um, 
some were written by Saskatchewan playwrights. Uh, since it was a look back, I wanted something that was a look back. And why Unity 1918 quickly rose to the to the top of that list uh, for a few reasons. I've always loved the play, personally. Always wanted to be in it. It was kind of making its big splash just as I was finishing my BFA and always thought, well, maybe when Persephone or the Globe did it in Saskatchewan, I'd get to play Hart. But <laughs> <laughs> um, they never did the play. However, Kelly Jo Burke did get permission to do a shortened version when she was still at CBC Saskatchewan. So I did get to play Hart in a radio version. And and also too, there are a, a number of strong young women in the department right now. And I knew that we would have the actors we would need to play all those parts. And it would include multiple students um, in this anniversary project. So that's, that's kind of why it became the first pick. Um, and of course, as you know, though that was all happening before anything happened here in terms of COVID, like yes, uh, it was being reported and we knew that it was further east, but there was no sense that it was going to come and uh, surround the world in the way that it has. Um, I, I was, um, I, I felt some like, okay, this, we can still potentially do this when, when we did the first round of auditions. The number of students who were familiar of the, with the play because David had, has used it in the past uh, in terms of his props class. It's like, here, read this play. Um, in terms of, I think even with set, like, how would you do this play? So a number of the students were familiar with it and were extremely excited when we said that this was the play that we wanted to do. Um, so that, that was, that was heartening to know that the students wanted to do it, even though all of this was happening at the time that we were doing the first round of auditions. And in terms of ever thinking about, to put it aside, from a safety point point of view, I guess, yes, and not knowing in the ever-changing landscape of what you're allowed to do and who's allowed to do what based on what province you're in or what country you're in, because restrictions are always changing and different. Um, you know, we wanted to do it last fall originally, which I thought worked quite well because the play takes place between October 15th and November 26th, as I recall, give or take, end of November. Um, but pushing it and giving it some time, I'm glad we did that because at least we're getting to, to do it now and getting to do it in the building, although under restrictions. So no, not really. I didn't really want to put it aside. <laughs> it felt timely, obviously. How have the cast found the experience of working on a play about an epidemic while they're actually living through an epidemic? What they found easy to connect to, where have they found it difficult? Uh, pretty easy. <laughs> pretty easy especially when we get to the sections about masks and requirements we still laugh like every time we just you know we did another run through last night and uh, the two actors that are playing rose and doris mackenzie and avery like some of the best dialogue are those two women in in the telegraph office and you never get to hear the other side of the conversations but you get to fill in the gaps and the things that rose says to the to the you know the individuals that she's talking to are like this could just be now it could be now it's like yes you have to wear a mask yes so why are you still bringing this up um i think in terms of how they're finding it though and, and something we haven't had a chance to talk about yet too is that kevin's play is extremely funny and so amidst all of these things that are happening um he's managed to to do away and it's my favorite kind of humor the the more I find the, the more direct and straight down the middle the characters play these situations, the funnier they become. So the more we've said, don't play it for the laugh, just play it honestly. And then all of a sudden it becomes five times funnier than the first time they did it. And I think that laughter is also getting everyone through it. That despite the dark parts of the story, we're still laughing, and but we're laughing together and we're in a room together. And I think they're just so glad to be back working on something physically not digitally right. um, that that has been a, a big plus for everyone myself included so what do you found most rewarding about working on the play under these circumstances what's been most challenging what surprised you and them about it um rewarding is, is always seeing well any actor in, in when i'm directing a play but in this particular instance with the students when all of a sudden you see a penny drop like like maybe you give a note or a suggestion or ask them a question to think about and then all of a sudden three days later it just drops in and they're performing in a way that they weren't 
just a matter of days ago. And I always loved seeing those progressions. And then when one actor does it, you can then see the other actors go, oh, now we've got to match them. So I just, I love watching the progression of people's process and performances. And the design students are doing such great work and under such tough situations too. Um, every time we come back in to rehearse in the evening, a huge new chunk of the sets there and more props are arriving and, and it, it takes on a tactile portion of the production that's just not there. Um, the, in terms of challenges, um, you know, there's, there's just the physical too. We, we never know when things could change, good or for bad in terms of restrictions. So I made it quite clear to everyone, it's like, look, we need to keep these safety precautions in mind the entire time and not assume that we're going to get the green light for something and then all of a sudden have to go back or change what we've done up to that point. So I wanted to make sure that we were working on a version of Kevin's play that we are going to be able to do no matter what was presented to us by the time we get to perform it. Um, so there's some things I would like to do or or I feel like is even inherent in Kevin's stage directions that we have to find a way to do slightly different just because of the restrictions we find ourselves in. So that's that's been a challenge, but I'd rather take on that challenge than not do the play at all. Okay. Well, we'll move on to the second half and go ahead, Carla, you can play the last slide or the next slide. How was 2021 like and not like 1918? And we said that coming back to the point I made, this is Mason's uh, work, but he bit very quick comparison. He said, if you were performing in 1918, you really had very few options. You pretty much had to just close the theater or go home. Um, Radio was starting, but it wasn't being used for entertainment purposes. That was a later period, so people couldn't shift onto the radio at that time. Um, film was, existed, but it tended to be a rich form that was happening in the States, so people had to go there. So there wasn't much you could do. As I said, it, it kind of brought the end of that particular theater. When COVID strikes here, yeah, the theaters closed down, but that doesn't mean the theater closed us down in the same way. Uh, we've got a professional theater locally. We've got government support to help people going. And the technology has increased incredibly. Um, we've got digital theater. People sometimes are doing outdoor theater. They do it face to face, but they change audience arrangements. There's pre recorded uh, recordings. We also have uh, people are coming back to stage but it's often performed online instead. And people are performing for their own audiences instead of for tourists. And that, that's particularly true of New York. Um, the private life of actors and audience is shown live stream performances. So open, open audience interactions and discussions are amongst themselves. It changes the whole etiquette that goes with theater. So it's sort of transposed itself into another key, but it's continuing to go on. So that's, uh, it's still very much alive, very much with us. Closing the theater isn't closing the theater in the way it was in 1918. And university theater, the same thing. And it depends on where you are in Canada. We found, at least until the spring, if you were in the Atlantic provinces, you were still very much acting the way you had before. If you were in BC, you had a break because it's nice and warm out there. So you could do more outdoor theater. It says Saskatchewan, hard to do that in January. Um, Ontario and Quebec were often under the toughest restrictions. Everything had to be online because that's where the pandemic hit the hardest. But we were still able to keep going. So I'm going to put the same question to Erica. Uh, how's the response of contemporary Saskatchewan to COVID, both like and unlike the response of 1918 Saskatchewan, the Spanish flu? I think it said radio that wasn't really there in 1918 made a difference to later eras. Absolutely. I think our means of communication now are just dramatically different and it changes some of the ways in which we get information, how we process that information, how we can stay connected. But I think those feelings of isolation are still with us. Even as we, you know, share this space on our Zoom screens, I still miss the face-to-face. -face. I miss the off-camera chats. 
And I think those feelings of connectedness are, are still challenged in the 2020 and 2021 version. I think there are other, other things though that are very, very, very similar. And already both Kevin and Sky mentioned, you know, the questions about masks or the issues about like what precautions people should take. The, these are so similar that you can almost take, you know, the exact language. In fact, we I did a little quiz with my my students. You know, I showed them some anti-masking. Um, if you look at the quality of the image, you can tell which era it comes from. But if you describe or you just read out the words of the anti-mask rallies that were taking place in 1918, it sounds unbelievably, you know, almost like exactly the same as what's taking place. So I think these kind of deeper, and Kevin mentioned the kind of dystopic or um, apocalyptic tones, these deeper feelings of distrust that for, are formed during these pandemic moments, these places that kind of shake us to, you know, questioning our place in, in society, who we should trust, what we should trust, science, religion, you know, bleach, um, you know, where do we turn to, to get our kind of, our um, sort of ropes or our, our lines of, of support? And I think those sort of human feelings run throughout these examples in ways that really connect us to this past in really you know, intimate ways. Yeah, Kevin, this probably comes back to the question I asked earlier, but where do audiences in 2021 living in another global pandemic still see themselves in Unity 1918? Do they respond to the play differently than they did in earlier times? Um. Yeah, I think it. I, I'm I'm curious about that too. Actually, uh, I, I think there's a, a um, an interesting, um, you know, uh, there's a bit of a division. I think when the pandemic uh, hit uh, last spring, um, there was a bit of a surge of people watching movies like Contagion on Netflix. Uh, but I would talk to people and 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 be in agreement with them when they would say that's the last thing I want to do is spend time watching a story about a pandemic. When I'm actually living it, but I, I do think there's there can be a kind of comfort and a kind of um, you know a recognition of of um, uh, of that shared experience, um, and uh, I, I I think some things will just seem uh, just all the more recognizable, but maybe for that then that you know that event um, can. Uh, sort of kind of do what it's supposed to do in the terms of the theater experience is then just form the backdrop and let the, the story of the characters come forward. So maybe there's a, a kind of increased um, trust or something in the, in the story when you recognize certain things like mask protocols or whatever as being just really truly um, familiar. Okay, Sky. As a member of the professional stage community in Saskatoon, can you speak to your own experience in surviving and hopefully thriving in COVID? Huh, thriving? Huh, I don't know. I'm very grateful to be working on this right now. I can, I can <laughs> certainly say, say that. Um, we were one week away from opening Stones in His Pockets at Persephone Theatre when everything got shut down. And for those first few weeks, it was. It was very, a lot of uncertainty not that there's certainty now but at that point there was obviously many many questions and not knowing how my wife's also a theater artist so how are we going to pay our bills how are we going to make sure that our daughter comes through this um in terms of you know feeling like she's getting what she needs from school and from us um so having even something like you know the serve and then the now crb especially in those first few months, knowing that, okay, well, at least I'm going to be able to pay my bills and that, that will be enough for now. Um, but also too, it, I think because of other things that happened in the months that followed in terms of George Floyd's death and, and a lot of um, structural and systemic things are under the microscope. And at least this great pause has, has given individuals and organizations the opportunity to kind of really look at the way we do what we do in many aspects. So I, I do feel like there's going to be a new way of doing things. Uh, not that it'll be perfect when we all kind of get back to quote unquote normal, but I do feel like that we're using this opportunity to take the steps towards doing theater in a different way, which I think ultimately will be will be good for everyone. Yeah. 
How is the stage in immunity 1918 being affected by health and safety regulations? Maybe you've already answered that, but. Um, well, I could, yeah, I guess I touched on it, but like I could, you know, give some specific examples without giving, you know, too much away from the plot. But, you know, there's at times characters kiss each other. And I told everyone right off the bat, well, you're not going to be kissing them, <laughs> obviously, but staging them in such a way that, you know, they block the view because we're going to be live streaming it. Uh, we're not going to have audience members in the theater live. It's going to be streamed. So knowing that an actor can step in front of another actor and block the view and lean in as if they've kissed, things like that. Um, one instance, two characters are, it says, you know, they shake hands and then they realize after they've shaken hands, they kind of wipe their hand on their pant leg. Um, well, to try to capture the same thing that Kevin has in that in that stage direction, they go to shake hands and then they both realize, oh, we're not supposed to. And then they kind of drop their hand and still kind of do the brushing action. So they never actually touch, they, they stop. So there's lots of those kind of things that were like, okay, you can't physically touch, so you catch yourself before you do it and still play the awkwardness of the moment. So things like that we've had to tweak. Um, and the biggest one too, uh, and, and, you know, Carla had the, made the suggestion early on but we're not going to have audience and we want space why do we have uh, a riser in there for people to sit on when we can't have people in here sitting so we took the risers right out and we're using the whole space as if it's a playing area to to get more distance and let people be in scenes together but be a bit further apart than they normally will so we're trying to make it uh, um, a positive exercise and stretching what we think we can do in that space too which which has been great everyone stepped up to the challenge okay well two more questions for you and then we'll move on to our final closing thoughts <laughs> have there been advantages and disadvantages to producing the production the spring summer session you know, it was originally supposed to be in the fall we've ended up doing it in the spring mm -hmm. i think the biggest disadvantage is that i don't see them on a regular basis usually in the fall i'm in the building as a session while teaching a class and so there's a sense of seeing them during the day at least some of them whether they're in a class i'm teaching or not and then into the evening so one you know you tend to be around a bit more often to answer questions and while some people do reach out by text or email it's not quite the same as being in the building during the day and then meeting them at night so sometimes it feels a bit separated um i think that the biggest plus is that for the most part they're not taking as many classes right now um, than they would be during the during the year. So some of them are busier than others, of course, because everyone has their, their their own personal lives and jobs that they have to do. But for some of them, they've really been able to sink into the work. And so they go away after we're done rehearsals at night. And you can tell that they've been able to put in the kind of work that they might be able to do in, under a professional situation because they're not in class all day. Right. Um, so that is, I think that's been a plus for, if, for some of them as they come in and they are, they are ready to work and some of them got off book like super early, um, which, which is a benefit if you, if you're in a position to do that, because then you can play in a way that you can't when you're still got your script in your hand. Would you do it again? Yeah. Yeah. I, I you know, I, as much as I wish we could be doing it in front of a live audience um, and and not have to maybe have some of the restrictions that we have. Not that I don't think the restrictions are important. And just if we were in a situation where we didn't have to need them, um, despite all that, we, you know, wishing and what ifs, I think it has been good for everyone to be telling a story in general, but specifically this story. So yeah, yeah, in a New York minute, I'd do it again. Okay, okay closing thoughts. Uh, what do we got to look forward to to post COVID? Uh, what things have we experienced during the pandemic that will help us moving forward? So just very quickly, Erica. Yeah, I mean, I always think that moving forward requires looking back. Um, but when we're living in a pandemic moment, people don't want to think back. They want to move forward. And we're in this kind of anxious moment where reflection is really difficult to do, you know, trying to zoom ahead. And I think I'm really excited about watching this performance performance and also looking at how it has an impact on our community going forward because I think this is exactly the kind of thing that allows us to get some distance from our own isolated lives right now and to process some of the really difficult feelings that we all have as we imagine a future in a post-pandemic world and how we give meaning to what that pandemic has done to change the way we interact with one another. So thank you 
thank you for including me in this, but also thank you so much for all the work that you're doing. I think it's really important historically as much as it is in our contemporary world. Okay, Kevin, final thoughts. Um, yeah, I think, uh, well, I, I, you know, uh, uh, I think Sky um, really um, uh, hit it with the sense that this time in all of the uh, challenge that it's that it's uh, presented for theater artists for performing arts. Um, this period of reflection has been incredibly powerful. And I think looking forward, uh, there's going to be um, uh, a lot of optimism in, in a seeing um, uh, a shift into where theater will be going um, and, uh, and, and um, how much more hopefully uh, inclusive it will be uh, in terms of the stories told and the audience is embraced. And I think there's gonna, I, I hope, I've been optimistic, optimistic from the beginning that we're gonna really crave being together. So I hope that that turns out to be true and that there's a lot of desire to get into a room with other humans. Okay, thank you. Sky, final thoughts. Um, well, maybe not a final thought, but I'll just use the opportunity since since he's here in the Zoom room with us too, and it's not just some you know weird anonymous email after the fact too, <laughs> but you know, I just make a point of like thanking Kevin for writing such a great play. Like I, I would make jokes with friends like Dan McDonald's, a good friend of mine, and one of our more prolific playwrights here in Saskatchewan. And I would always joke with him if his play got a third production that he had written a Canadian classic, that that was, that was the tipping point. Once you got that third production, it meant, there, there you go, it happened. Um, and although Kevin's play has had many more than, than three productions already, like it's, it's rare Canadian or not, I think to, to have a play that somehow will keep having life beyond. And he certainly has, has written one and, even though I didn't get to be in it like I wanted when I was younger, I'm, I'm grateful that he's let us do it in this circumstance and that I get to work on it. So that's my final thought is just a thank you. Okay. So just a reminder, Unity 1918 is playing at eight o'clock, June 17th, 18th, 19th via live stream as part of our 75th anniversary celebrations. Tickets are on sale through our anniversary and Greystone Theatre site online. And please consider coming out to our final weekend of events. So. Thank you, everyone. So long. <laughs>